Britain's housing crisis never leaves the headlines. There just aren't enough homes for people who need them. Over 200,000 properties are lying empty, whilst families sit on waiting lists. And despite rising rents, millions of tenants are still living in shocking conditions. I'm Matt Allwright, and I'm joining teams across the UK to tackle this scandal head on. Helping those in need of a decent place to call home, turning detective to investigate some of these forgotten properties to discover what lies behind the door. It's getting harder and harder to find a safe and secure place to call home. And that means the work of councils, charities and even developers is more crucial than ever in providing much needed homes for people, whoever they are, and whatever their situation. In my case file today... Good morning. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I investigate a cramped terrace in a worrying state of repair. What's going on here? We've got a light fixture, and then hanging off that is like a garage inspection lamp. It's, it's grim. In Birmingham, an overgrown property is taking over the neighbours. Oh, oh, my oh. God. So just the weight of this buddleia and bramble Everything we've got here is just is just torn the fence down completely. Yeah, yeah. And a house empty for 20 years. How nice is this kitchen? It's beautiful. Finally becomes a home again. This is life changing for us. If you rent your home from a private landlord, your accommodation must meet an acceptable safety standard. When this doesn't happen, it's the job of council housing officers to ensure landlords fix any problems so their tenants can remain safe and secure in their homes. In Liverpool, the council housing team are always ready to help tenants who may be living in unacceptable conditions, whoever they are. I'm with housing officers Andrew, Laura and Craig. They've received reports that a city landlord who owns numerous properties might not be taking his responsibilities or the welfare of his tenants seriously. Good morning, good morning. The council's concerned that his poor management is taking advantage of a vulnerable section of society, the local immigrant population. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Good morning. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. This terraced house is home to a couple and their four children, with another one on the way. It's not long before Laura spots an issue with the conditions. They don't have a lock, so it looks like they've been using oh. a toothbrush, like a DIY homemade lock here. OK, so how does that work? So when you're in... That's just holding the... It's holding that there the so you can lock the, yeah. the bathroom door. Which obviously doesn't give them much privacy, really. No, I also noticed that down at the bottom, at the skirting board, it looks like there's rot. And there might just be a clue to where the water's getting in. We believe that there's been a leak. I don't yeah. know if you can see it, Matt. But, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. Just up the stairs. Yeah, there's been quite a crew sort of paint job over it. Yeah. Um, but it has been leaking through, so that might have given rise to some of the damp here around the skirt. Have a look at the kitchen next? Yeah. Oh, man. The hallway might be dilapidated, the kitchen's even worse. So the kitchen units, if you can call them that, are just hanging on for dear life. Can I do go for that one? There you go. I think that's been nailed in. Also, the work surface is bent in half and it's missing its laminate surface there for a big chunk of it. It's coming away at the back as well. This place is pretty awful. And as for the electrics, well, let's say it's an interesting setup. What's going on here? We've got a light fixture, and then hanging off that is like a garage inspection lamp. It's, it's grim. Um, just looking here, Craig, we've got a kitchen window which has got no visible means of securing it. So potentially that might not be able to be secured. That seems to be as far as it will go out as well. The floor is intact. Actually, the floor you could clean. Unfortunately, at where the yeah. kitchen wall joins the uh, the floor at the near the entry, you can see sort of the, the tiles have come away uh, and even the sort of, you know, 
the plaster underneath is starting to come free there. The kitchen isn't fit for purpose. And as for the backyard... Is that it? Yeah. Oh, it'll be like a postage stamp. Ah, oh, OK. So we've got basically enough space for you to stand, Craig. Yeah. Possibly you and me if we were dancing. I, I that's some... that's about it. It looks to me like a perfect breeding ground for vermin. This is yeah, dreadful. obviously it's... You look in the backyard like that and you think to yourself, it'll be more of a surprise if there aren't rats. Uh, and cockroaches and mice, because it's giving them everything they need right there. And then in this kitchen, I mean, and it just, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I mean, that's it, it doesn't work. This is a typical Victorian two up, two down, and clearly not designed for families of this size. So we've got two bedrooms. Yep. There's a little boy asleep in there. Going to the front bedroom. We've got one double bed here. We've got a wardrobe that looks ready to fall over. Yeah. It seems like a lot of baby buggies. I've counted, there was one in the street, there was one downstairs, there's one here, and there's a crib as well. There do seem to be too many people living in this small property. The question is, how much blame lies with the landlord? There's a level of, once the property's occupied and the money is coming in, the sort of involvement with it will end uh, until the family moves out or the money stops. Um, it'll kind of be a case of sort of out of sight, out of mind for a lot of landlords due to the number of properties they have in a portfolio. If they haven't got appropriate management structures in place, then you know there is every chance that these properties will be left to, to fall into disrepair. They're making the best of what they've got haven't they here? For a big family in a small house, they're doing the best they can. And despite the poor state of repair and the overcrowding, the families seem to be accepting of their situation. We have a, a fantastic interpreter here. Uh, what's your name? Brittany. 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 I'm Matt. How do you do? Nice to meet you. Um, who is helping us because my Romanian is non-existent. Uh, but she speaks both Romanian and English, which is great. Who sleeps where? Me and my sister. We are sleeping Still in the camera. Where is the boy sleeping now? Yeah. And my mom brings us there. And my dad was sleeping here. On the sofa. Yeah. And my yeah. brother. This bed. This one. This is the bed. Yeah. Mix the bed. bed. And then my brother and the other brother so the are sleeping in the big camera. And do you sleep well? Do you get a good sleep? Yes. yes. It's okay. Yeah. OK, can you ask them how do they like, how do you like living in this house? How is it? What's it like? Yes, but the only bit part, the thing that is raining and in the kitchen. So that's when it rains, the water comes through into the kitchen. Is that happening now? In the kitchen. Just here, on the stairs? Thank you so much for letting us into your home. Can you say that to your mum and dad? Thank you so much for letting us into your home. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Laura, have you seen everything you need to see? Yeah, we've, we've finished the inspection, obviously. We've taken some photos and we'll go back with a view to maybe taking some enforcement against the landlord. So this two-bedroom Victorian terrace is in serious need of maintenance and isn't big enough for the family living in it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. The family say they're happy in the property, but certainly from the council's perspective, things just aren't good enough. These uh, people have recently come to Liverpool. These are recent immigrants to the UK. If you come in uh, to the country on those terms, what sort of pick do you have of the housing stock? What, what are your options, typically? Well, you'd have very little options, to be honest. You'd be, you know, you would be quite vulnerable. So, you know, as a general rule, you'd be probably looking to take anything that was available at that time. You've got to understand that these people are in a foreign country. They're vulnerable. They don't know the culture. And I mean, like we understand about Eastern Europeans, predominantly Romanian communities, is they do like to sort of remain as a community. So there is a high concentration in this area and the properties are poor. And really, you know, the pre-1919 terrace property is very small and, you know, in the ideal world, probably wouldn't be here today. Uh, but, you know, we have to make the best with the existing stock we have. 
It's a tricky situation, but at least the family is now on the housing team's radar. It's thanks to their hard work that living conditions can be improved for them and communities across the city. There are all sorts of reasons why a property can be left empty. A disinterested landlord or a buy-to-let investment gone wrong. Sometimes, sadly, it's because the owner has died and there's no will or family around. And that's bad news for everyone, not least local families who need a home. But probate research companies can be brought in to help ensure a property is sold and put back into use. This two-bedroom semi near Nottingham has been empty for over eight years after the owner died without leaving a will, and it's looking in a pretty sorry state. Having been out of use for so long, it urgently needs to become a home once again. Anglia Research probate caseworker Matt Boardman tracks down the relatives of the deceased and helps them claim their inheritance, including any property. The house has been empty for eight and a half years since the owner passed away. We were referred the matter uh, by the authorities to try and trace the rightful beneficiaries to the deceased estate. There are a few loose ends that we need to, to tie up um, just to make sure that we've accounted for, for everybody. Although Matt traced some of the beneficiaries, he needs to make sure everyone's accounted for. As well as looking for any useful paperwork, he's been instructed to check that the property is secure. It's alarming, really, because, you know, we're in a street here, you know, they are fairly modern houses, so for it to be standing empty as it is now, it just it seems crazy, considering it's been eight and a half years with, with um, you know, no occupancy. You know, somebody could have been enjoying, and um, you know, their life in this street. Time to get inside. Oh, blimey. Wow. It's a mess, with piles of clutter and junk mail dating back years. I mean, it's not in the, in the best state, but bearing in mind it's been, um, it's been empty for, for eight and a half years, I think it could, could have been considerably worse. It turns out the deceased owner's friends had partly cleared the property after his death. I wondered if they emptied the fridge. You never know what could be lurking inside. There's just some uh, milk bottles that have been in there for for quite a while, I'm assuming. Matt, how long is quite a while? 2010 date on them, which is, uh, which is not very nice. In the living room, there's evidence of how vulnerable this empty house has been. Uh, you can see there's some broken glass on the floor. Unfortunately, we've, um, we've had a few break-ins um, since it's, it's been vacant and it's boarded up now. With the property secure for now, Matt can continue his search for any remaining beneficiaries. Things like personal effects, and then of course any paperwork relating to the person that lived here, any bank accounts, any kind of thing that's going to, to relate to his estate, including any, any debts and liabilities, we'll be, we'll be looking to, to, um, to take details of that as well. And it's not long before Matt gets lucky just come across this actually could be um, could be really helpful. It's a really old medical card um, with the deceased owner's um, date of birth on it. It's got his name, his NHS number, which is which is really helpful for us to to run some further inquiries. Just finding little snippets of information like um, you know somebody's medical card can be kind of invaluable for us really as a, as a research firm. It seems Matt's close to cracking this case. To find out more about how he's done it, I've come to meet him at his office. Hey, Matt, how are you? Nice Hello. to meet you. Nice to meet you. So what have we got to go on, then? Where do you start with this one? So we start with the deceased himself. We locate his birth record. We go from there um, to try and find out who his mother and father are, um, and then branch the family out as much as we can to locate, um, in this case, um, surviving cousins who will, will benefit from from the sale of, of his property and any other assets that he may have. So we've got the deceased there, and it's really at the level of uh, uncles and aunts where it gets really quite numerous. Yeah, I mean, you know, the majority of aunts and un uncles have passed away and we've had to, to find their children, hence the surviving cousins, uh, the vast majority of which live in the UK, and we've located and, um, and you know, we've, we've proven that they, they are, you know, entitled 
With the main beneficiaries identified, Matt's job is now to get the property back into circulation as soon as possible. OK, so in terms of the time scale then, and getting this place sold and back on the market, yeah. is it easy to, to say how long we're looking at now? I mean, it, it, it's not easy. Um, every case varies. Um, in this particular case, we've, you know, we've been lucky with, you know, we've conducted the research and we've located um, the entitled relatives, you know, quickly. Um, and we've got the process moving quite quickly. So um, I think from this point onwards, I think maybe six to nine months. Obviously, you're, you're often going in to the homes of people who are deceased. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, strange, a strange part of the job, I would think. It, it is a strange part of the job, but, you know, from a professional point of view, I mean, you know, we need to, to kind of get that into a, a state where, you know, we can get it ready for, for our new Buyer, really. yeah. The whole point is that this can be a vibrant, active family home again for somebody else. You know, yeah. it's actually providing a roof over somebody's head. Yeah, absolutely. To ensure that happens quickly, Matt's been instructed by the relatives to obtain a valuation on the property from local estate agent Francesca. Hi, Hi Francesca. Hi. How are you? You're right. All right. Thank you. Are you? Yeah, not too bad. Good. You ready to go and have a look yep. inside? Yeah. Okay. If she likes what she sees, it could be back on the market as a family home within weeks. We are going to be clearing everything that's, um, okay. that you see, so it's, it's quite clearly not going to be in, in this state yeah. once it, um, it does go to market. Obviously, it's going to be cleared, and then is that it? We're going to try to get rid of the hedge in front, because you can't actually see the front door. Yeah. Is the window going to be fixed and things? Yes. Yeah, OK. Yeah. I'm not sure the property's quite what Francesca was expecting. We do see empty properties. It's, it's rare that they're vacant for five years or more. So obviously it is surprising to see that because I didn't know it had been vacant for so long. Obviously it needs a lot of work. Okay. Heating, that's quite yeah, old, isn't it? it, it is. Does it work, do you know? Um, I'm not terribly sure. Okay. I mean, I suppose we can, I mean, they're storage heaters, aren't they, so... Yeah. It's important that the heating is working at the property. Um, obviously, if it's not working, you have to divulge that information to potential buyers. So before, obviously, it goes on the market, I would suggest that those sorts of things are looked into. After eight years empty, it's clear the property needs some work, but Matt's keen to highlight the positives. Structurally, it, it seems... It seems like, you know, pretty sound, really. Yeah. So I think, considering it has been vacant for, for that time, I think it's not going to take too much to... Um... It's just unlifting, isn't it? It yeah. just needs a bit of TLC. Yeah. You can say that again. I wonder if the bathroom will win over Francesca. Personally, I love avocado. OK. I really do. Is it all double glazed? Uh, no, I don't think it is, actually. No, Francesca, but it could be. It's a two-bedroom semi. It's been empty for eight years, it's got no heating and it's in need of refurbishment. What does Francesca think of the potential for this property? It needs cleaning, clearing, etc. But once obviously that's been done, it will be appealing to the current market. Well, Francesca came back with a valuation on the property of £90,000, significantly lower than the £130,000 average price for this area. So it's no surprise that only six months later, the property was snatched up by someone with ambitions to turn it into a family home once again. Tony and his family are local developers and immediately saw potential beyond the years of neglect. Uh, I'm quite surprised when she told me it had been empty for eight years because inside it's not that bad considering it's been empty for that long. The reason we picked this house was um, location, the things that we look for in, in the house mainly is uh, the possibilities of what you can make it into rather than what it is at the moment. Tony negotiated the price down further to just £85,000, bit of a bargain if you ask me, leaving him enough budget to breathe new life back into the house. Now, work is well underway. Gone are the dodgy storage heaters, replaced with brand new central heating. And you know, the lovely avocado bathroom, Oh, it's been replaced. The tiling's been done as we, as we speak. That's about halfway through. Then we'll move downstairs. So the patio doors will be here in the centre. Uh, and then once you open those up, you can go out onto a nice patio there with table and chairs and things. And we're going to do like a gravel type garden with just shrubs and tubs and things like that, you know. So low maintenance for people, because 
obviously usually people renting houses, uh, they, they're working people, they're busy, they haven't got time. Not many people want to do lots of gardening now. So if we can make that easy maintenance for people, and it'll look, still look nice, but not have to take too much of their time to, to keep it looking that way. Well, there's no time like the present. Tony's already started tackling the overgrown garden. But it soon grows. Nature soon takes over, I think. I mean, the garden next door is really nice, this side. And obviously that growing over there is not what you want going into your garden when you've just done it all. Bindweed, but it just grows like a, like a blanket. It's so strong as well. That's mixed in with uh, like brambles as well. <laughs> Spiky, that is. <laughs> he reckons the project will be completed in just three months and hopes the value of the property could rise to £130,000, which is the local average. But while that's good news for the bank manager, the real success here is in bringing the house back to life. Don't get me wrong, you've got to make a profit at the end of the day, but if you've got to enjoy what you're doing as well, and I, and I love it, I really enjoy it. I think it's very important to put houses like this back into use for people to live in because it's such a waste. When there's something that can be done up and someone living in it, a family living in it, it's, you know, there are a lot of properties like that. Well, after eight years and a mammoth effort, I'm glad to see that this house will finally be called home once again. Antisocial behaviour. Three little words that can mean a whole lot of trouble for both tenants and housing officers. For tenants, it's no fun living next door to noisy neighbours, overgrown gardens, or having rubbish dumped unceremoniously on your doorstep. And for the housing officer, tackling antisocial behaviour can mean having to play the role of policeman and diplomat all rolled into one. Everyone has the right to a decent, safe place to live. But that doesn't just mean the roof over their heads. In Maidstone, Alex is a neighbourhood advisor for Golding Homes, responsible for the welfare of tenants living in seven and a half thousand housing association properties across Kent. We're off to one of our estates where we're getting reports of youths, illegal drug use, antisocial behaviour, um, just causing a nuisance. So I'm popping along there now to see what we can do to help the neighbourhood alleviate themselves of that problem. It isn't just the interests of his tenants he's looking out for today. Nearby residents have also complained a recreation area behind a block of the Housing Association's flats is blighting their lives too. As a landlord, we've got a wider responsibility. Our communal gardens that are backing onto some private homes are causing some issues for those private home owners. And as a responsible landlord, we want to do our best. So we're actually going to go and have a look to see what we can do proactively to reassure them that we're taking our responsibilities seriously. But until he gets there, Alex has absolutely no idea what he's going to find. This is the communal gardens. As you can see, they're not that easy to get to. Uh, we've got a couple of security gates to get through. Straight away, it's obvious all isn't well here. You can immediately see that there's some access issues there, but first thing that strikes you is that the, the boundary is insecure in the fact that our fencing's been damaged. And it's the same story inside. So this is the land that, that we're getting complaints about. As you can see, it's pretty insecure and the trestling laying and the fencing's been brought down. Also the wall itself, if kids are getting over there, then maybe we can think about some anti-climbing paint. Tucked away from prying eyes, it's easy to see how what should be a little oasis for the tenants has become a haven for antisocial behaviour. I can see there's been some fires attempted here. But Alex is also searching for signs it's been harbouring a darker secret. With regards to the drugs, I can't see any evidence, and certainly working with our partners, Kent Police, they haven't highlighted any major concerns on the estate. So I think 
predominantly I'd be recommending that we secure some of our boundaries. We'll maybe have a, a chat with this neighbour here because their fencing has obviously been damaged by the youths. Although there are no signs of illegal drug use. Hello. So I'm Alex Eclair, I'm the neighbourhood officer and I've been asked to come up and have a look at the issues you're having because your garden backs onto our communal land. The neighbour with the smashed fence confirms Alex's fears. So is it the same kids time and time again then? Um, depends what time it is. Because right. we have the younger kids, mm. um, but they can be out on weekends and holidays, they can be out till st stupid o'clock. Um, and then you've got the older ones, and there's the older ones that generally do the drugs. And We've had incidents of, you can probably hear my cat meowing now, of them throwing things over the fence and nearly hitting the cat. So I'm concerned about your fence as yeah. well and the fact that it's them, it's pushing they've it and it, it right looks in. Yeah. OK. Because yeah. um, they've got into my garden um, and they've also got into next door's garden. It's an unacceptable situation. The tenant's outdoor space has been turned into a no-go area and the neighbours don't feel safe in their own gardens. What I'm going to do is I'm going to raise with our repairs team uh, some security of the locks, so we'll change the locks there. We'll also reinstate the boundary fencing that, that's been damaged and put anti-climb paint on both sides of the wall. So uh, we'll do all of that and in the next couple of weeks, if you've got any issues, give us a call and we'll come back out again. OK, okay thanks Bye. for your time. So that was actually quite a, a, a good chat. She's given us a, a rough idea of what the issues she's actually having. Now what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to knock on some doors and speak to some other residents and find out how widespread this problem is with the youths. My name's Alex Sinclair, I'm a neighbourhood advisor with Golden Homes. I'm talking to uh, your neighbours regarding our communal land behind your home and the issues you're having with it. And although the occupant of this house doesn't want to go on camera, she is happy to talk to Alex about just how bad things have become. She's really just confirmed what we already know uh, it's affecting our family and our young children not being able to play in the garden. So. I think uh, that's enough evidence for us that we can actually do those adaptations or those repairs and we'll just take it from there, really. Allowed to go unchecked, anti-social behaviour can have a huge impact on the lives of whole communities. Luckily for the people living here, Alex and his colleagues are on hand to help. This is just a typical firefighting visit where it's bread and butter for neighbourhood officers. We respond predominantly to calls from neighbours who are concerned that their neighbourhood, their family are, are being disrupted by people who don't necessarily live on the estate. So I've evidenced enough here that we can actually be proactive and hopefully make the lives of these tenants as well as those uh, who are not our tenants a little bit safer by putting in these measures and hopefully making the neighbourhood better for those adaptations. So that's where we're at. The effect that a long-term empty property can have on a community is dramatic. It can even leave people feeling less safe in their homes. Many councils have dedicated empty homes teams whose job it is to investigate abandoned properties and work with owners to make sure they're brought back into use. But I've heard about one property in Birmingham that's pushed the council team to the limit. It's not always complaints from local residents that bring empty properties onto the council's radar. Sometimes the team themselves may come across one quite by chance. The one we're visiting today was discovered by empty homes officer Matt Smith's colleague while cycling home from work. We've been told it'll be easy to spot. Well, I think it's pretty obvious which one it is. Yeah. No gate, just straight into the jungle. Welcome um, to the jungle, as they say. And there's really nothing more to see, is there? Because you've got no way round the side. All we've got is a pretty grim front door with three bells on it. We've no information to go on so far, but I think I may have spotted the first potential clue. There's a key safe on the front. OK, yeah. 
Shall we have a look? Shall we have a look? Yeah. Blimey, this looks ten times worse up close. It's falling to bits. So we've got missing gutterin. Oh yes. Oh yeah. my goodness. And a big hole in the uh, in the soffit there. Yeah, yeah. A key safe there. Not that keys are necessary to get inside these days, but this does offer up one theory about the owner's situation. Could be that somebody's in care, maybe, or... So people can let themselves yeah. in because they, they, they can't get to the front door. There's a massive hole on the side here. Access to there would be very easy if you, um, if you wanted to get in. Yeah. wonder what the back's like. I think we could knock a neighbour's door, maybe they might uh, decide, maybe, yeah? Yep. Let's have a go. Get around that. The state this property's in, we're assuming that the owner has abandoned it. The two questions I have are why, and if so, could this empty property become a home again for somebody in need? Hello, Hello. Matt Smith from Vim City Council. The next door neighbour has kindly let us into their back garden so we can hunt for more clues. Oh, blimey, oh my blimey. God. Oh. We haven't even got a garden, have we? We've got a... It's just a sea of sort of brambles. Where do you even start? Not even the fence has been able to contain the jungle next door. So just the weight of this buddleia and bramble and everything we've got here has just, has just torn the fence down completely. Yeah, yeah. And it literally goes on and on, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a big garden. The plot thickens, quite literally. I wouldn't mind betting this garden was once well tended, but it feels as though suddenly, one day, everything just stopped. A chat with the neighbour off camera shed some light on what, sadly, appears to have happened. It sounds like he was taken into care and what's happened to him since, who knows okay. whether he's still there or not. So that's, that's something we can look into, obviously, through the care system. we hopefully locate where he is. Yeah. It's a terribly unfortunate situation, but at least we now know the owner is still around. It does, however, still leave Matt responsible for the impact the ramshackle house is having on the area. See, this sort of job sometimes is like twofold. It's the immediate effect. Yeah. The visual, obvious, immediate effect of, um, of the overgrowth. So, again, whilst it sounds a bit harsh, we can serve a notice on him. It sounds very harsh, but the fact is he's not going to be able to do it himself. So that notice just allows you then to start to start doing the to, work to clear it that's right and again at least at least from the neighbor's point of view you know they're gonna try and have half a decent house next door i mean it just just looking at it structurally it's 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 very perilous and yet it's connected to the houses either side yeah. so whatever you do to it is going to affect them one way or the other isn't it the two houses next door are pristine aren't they yeah you know absolutely looked after wonderfully and you've got almost like you know a thorn in between two roses, isn't it, type of thing? You know, you've got that sort of thing that's just the monstrosity affecting everybody. But it's, it's not secure, it's no. not watertight. No. Um, structurally, it looks like it could go at any moment. It's, you know, it, it is going to be causing a bit of a... Yeah. Um, a bit of a concern for either side, because they are both pristine. Yeah. There is a path, apparently... Is there? Up, uh, well, apparently, I can't see it but up the side, towards the back of the house. Are you brave? I'm brave. Are you brave? Right. So we'll have a go. Let's have a go. I don't like giving up, but I'm not hopeful we're going to get very far. No. There's no way through there. See, there probably was a couple of months ago. No, there isn't, yeah, is there? no way. It's hard to see from here whether there's any broken windows, whether people can actually get inside. I don't think we're going to get down there. We're not going to get any closer. And I'm not sure we need to at this stage, but it's a real shame. Here we have a two-bedroom house with a decent-sized garden. It could be a home for a couple or small family. At least we now know the circumstances that brought it into such disrepair. Wow, so there's a story in itself, isn't it? He's gone, but at some point, could even be coming back to this place. Oh, that's the thing, isn't it? It's uh, possibly in care, I think the neighbours said, didn't they? Yeah. So we're going to look on the care system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that might locate some family members. If not, it'll locate where he is, what care home he is in, if he's in a care home, yeah? Yeah. But then I think we just set about opening that dialogue. The priority for the moment is surely getting this place secure. For the neighbours' point of view, we've got to try and take some enforcement action and uh, trying to get that back garden cut down and the front cut down, because it's sort of painfully obvious to anybody walking by that this is the empty house, isn't it? And it also 
brings down the value and the enjoyment of living either side. Living next door to a classic empty house can devalue your house up to about 18%. So if you're trying to sell that house, is isn't fair, is it? And if uh, someone moves in with criminal intent, then you're living next door to malice. That would be, um, we're, a, we're not a town called Mallet, no, but that'd be better, wouldn't <laughs> Different it? Different song. Yeah. This old house is uh, facing uh, rough times. It's really only going to get worse uh, exponentially. Action has to be taken. The gentleman who used to live here, we don't know where he is, but it shouldn't be too hard to find him or his family. Let's hope it happens quickly. Brilliant. OK, okay. we know what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, Let's go. It's estimated there are over a million people on social housing waiting lists in England alone. That's a million people who may currently be living in cramped or unsuitable accommodation. That's why, when it comes to providing much-needed housing for families in need, bringing some of Britain's long-term empty homes back to life is vital. These are the new homes for old. With over 40,000 families in the UK currently accepted as homeless, empty properties are a scandalous waste. But all over the country, a shortage of affordable family homes to rent is leaving too many parents struggling to put a roof over their kids' heads. In Lowestoft, it's a situation mum and dad of six, Serena and Richard, know all too well. The landlord just wanted to sell some properties off, so we were made homeless by sort of no fault of our own, just one of those things. Yeah, we've been at this property now 10 years, so yeah, and that's, it's been home, the kids have grown up there, the kids are all sort of like young kids when we moved in there, now they're all teenagers and adults, young adults now, and for them, you know, that's, that's hard for them. Yeah, it's because home. That's their home because they've grown up there, you know. And with little or no hope of finding a new home in the area, they were facing an uncertain future. You know, it's been hard, and lots of the private sector these days, and it's hard to get to find anywhere to rent that and suitable for a family of our size, isn't it? Yeah. When we found out we were being evicted, I was really, really worried. But um, the landlord has given us some grace. So... Yeah, he's been brilliant, he? On that side of it. But yeah, but it's, it's a scary, daunting thing to Prospects. think you're going to lose your home and not have anywhere secure to go permanently. Luckily for Serena and Richard, that's all about to change thanks to the hard work of East Suffolk Council and housing officer Vicky. For two decades, this large three-bedroom terrace house sat empty. You heard that right, two decades. The property itself was in a complete state of disrepair. You'd never be able to have lived in it. The kitchen floor was rotten through. There was a massive buddleia growing through the whole back of the property and ivy had completely taken over the rear extension. It's hard to understand why anyone would just leave a valuable asset to rot when family homes are in such short supply here. That wasn't the only issue. Historically, there's been a lot of problems with the property being vandalised. The police have had to be called. Building control from the council have been called out a number of times to reports of it being a dangerous structure. There's been issues with rats and fly tipping. Generally, over the last 20 or so years, the property's been an absolute nightmare for the neighbours. So, pest problems, antisocial behaviour and at risk of collapse. As empty homes go, this place ticked every box. After repeated attempts to persuade the owner to act failed, eventually the council were forced to take drastic steps to bring this house of horrors back from the brink. The compulsory purchase uh, is a tool that we have available to us under the Housing Act. Uh, it enables us to purchase a property where the owner isn't willing to do anything to it themselves. We've been trying to liaise with the owner for the last 10 years to try and get them to bring their property back into use. And it's only in the last three years we've managed to secure a private purchase. And since the council got the keys nine months ago, they've been hard at work. What was a rat-infested wreck is unrecognisable. In the kitchen, the rotten floor and the filthy units have been ripped out, and it's now a cool contemporary space for cooking and eating. Upstairs, the crumbling walls have been re-plastered and redecorated, creating spacious, light-filled bedrooms. 
In place of the dingy, dated bathroom is a spotless new suite ready for a relaxing soak. And outside with that backyard jungle tamed, it's absolutely perfect for a family. Luckily for Richard and Serena, that family is theirs. Today they've brought daughter Rosie along to check out their new home for the first time. <laughs> wow. Oh, oh my god. It's our front room. This is gonna be so nice. Christmas, Christmas tree in the window. Go front room. Go front room. I ain't got to sleep on the floor anymore. I'm so happy. After all the worry of not knowing where they might end up. How nice is this kitchen? It's beautiful. Washing up duties for you, Rosie. Being able to make plans for the future must be a massive relief. And not just for Mum and Dad, either. Are you ready, Rosie? It's going to be your room. It's lovely. We can put our beds here, nice wardrobe there. Got you and Rose. Quite it's hard to imagine it's the same house, but Serena's having no trouble picturing the difference it's gonna make to the whole family. My mum's down the road, she's not well. My sister lives around the corner. Rosie gets the bus from over there. Two little ones go to the school along there. So it's just sort of somewhere permanent as well. So this big period terraced property with three bedrooms and a large garden had been left to rot for 20 years. But now it's gaining an extra bedroom and it's going to be a lovely home for a family that really needs it. Oh, wow. wow look, at this. look at this. And it's lovely. This house we've waited for a long time and it is beautiful and they've done such a lovely job on it. This is life changing for us. This is such a nice area and a nice home for our family. Our little family. Big family. It's <laughs> my new garden. It's been a long haul, but it's a fantastic result for the council as well. It's really nice to have worked on a project for such a long time. To finally see a family come in to make this their new home, it just kind of finishes the project off really nicely for us and, and gives you a really good feeling about why we do the work we do. After lying empty and abandoned for decades, what was every neighbour's nightmare of the house next door is finally getting a fairy tale ending. That's it for today, but join me again next time when I'll be back on the road tackling Britain's housing scandal head-on. <laughs>